This program is being provided by the 15 members of the Vancouver Educational Telecommunications Consortium, TV Etc. I've never caught a sockeye, but I've caught uh, chum salmon that look a lot like that when they spawn. Here's a, a Chinook. Those are big. And uh, hey, welcome to Dave's Kitchen. Hey. I'm Dave. And I'm Dave. And today, we're going to prepare silver salmon. How are we going to do it, Dave? Well, I think first you should show them how to break down a whole fish okay. into portions. And then uh, make a little rub for it. And then uh, I will sear it on the stove. And while you're doing all that, breaking down the fish and showing them how to do that, I'll go over and make some polenta and I'll saute some zucchini. And then at the end, we'll come together and make ourselves a nice little entree for dinner. This sounds great. Good deal. I'll get started on cutting up the fish. Wonderful. I'll be over right. making a polenta. It's a deal. And I'd like to first uh, talk a little bit about the fish and uh, how to tell how fresh a fish is or not. This one here is starting to dry a little bit on the tail, so it's starting to get a little bit of age to it. You can see some lines on this fish right here. And uh, my best guess is this was caught with a net as opposed to a hook and line caught fish. Another interesting thing about this fish is the uh, dorsal fin looks like it's non-rubbed, so it looks like it's a wild fish. The adipose is still intact, the dorsal fin is there, and all the other fins on this fish are in place. So my guess is this is probably a wild coho. You can push on the flesh. If it's resilient and bounces back to your touch, it's still uh, pretty fresh. And lastly, of course, our nose will tell us how fresh they are. Now, looking inside, you can see the cavity which have all been cleaned, but right in here there's still a, a trace of blood. This is where the bacteria are going to uh, cause the fish to spoil uh, most uh, quickly, as well as if the head were still attached. There's an old German expression. It's, it goes, it, the fish smells at the head first. And uh, owners and chefs used to use that for uh, firing people, an excuse to fire someone if they're in management. You just say, well, the fish smells at the head first, so you gotta go. Right now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools I'm going to use for, for working on this fish. Of course, there's a butcher's steel to keep our knife sharp. This is a large chef's knife or French knife that I really love to use on fish. Even uh, Chinooks that would be this big, this knife is great for it. Here's a fish fillet knife, carbon steel knife. This is stainless steel. Here's another fish fillet knife that I want you to see. You notice the flex in this blade. This one you could really get against the bones very, very well with. This little pair of pliers is perfect for pulling the pin bones out of fish, and it has a bent tip to it, which uh, I prefer rather than a straight tip because you can lay it on top of the flesh and just pull the bones on. I'll show you how to do that in a bit. This is a fish scaling tool that uh, we do use when we want to eat the, the skin of the fish. So what you would do is you'd hold the fish by the tail and use this as a rake and rake against the fish like this to get the, the scales off. Now it makes a really big mess and you really need to do it in an area that you can hose down. And we're, we're not going to prepare this fish with skin on, so I just wanted to show you this tool in case you uh, ever want to eat the skin. Okay, the first thing I like to do when I fillet one of these fish is I like to make an incision around the collar. This section of the fish we refer to as the collar, and it's where the head was removed and the gills were in there. And I'm going to take this large knife and make a couple of incisions on the collar. So, here we go. Make sure my hands are dry so I don't slip. Grab it right here. Take the knife, cut right behind the collar like so. I'm going to turn the fish over. When I turn the fish, I turn it gently. I'm not flipping it or flopping it. And wise fishermen handle their fish, their catch, with gentle hands as well. And ice it, because then you have less damage to the flesh. Next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take this knife and I'm going to take the blade and slide it all the way from the head of the fish to the tail to split the, the meat to separate it from the backbone. Now a fish's backbone is set like this. The spine runs this way and then there are ribs that come out around the, from the spine that surround the vital organs inside the fish and those are right here. And so this would all, all protect the internal organs, these bones and the muscle here as well. So what I'm going to do is lay my knife on top of the vertebrae and crack through the ribs with the blade. 
you might be able to hear the, the sound it's making and the, the type of cut I'm making. You see the angle that the knife is at in relation to the fish? It's not going like this, although that could work too, but I find it working well. If I'll start to push like this, look at where my, my left hand is right now and where my thumb is. This is the belly flap. My thumb is keeping the belly flap up in the air. I don't want my thumb down low either because I could hurt myself and I don't want the fish to lie like that because my knife can cut into the belly and I want to lift it up. So I'm going to crack through those ribs further, pushing the knife all the way along, all the way down to the tail. Now, I want to be really careful when I get close to the end of the fish because I'm applying quite a few pounds of force to the blade. And if I'm not careful, I can push too hard and the blade can slip. So as I approach the end of the fish, I'm going to lighten up the pressure. And at the very end, I'm just going to apply barely enough pressure to cut through. You can see why you need a really sharp knife to accomplish this. You don't want to do it with uh, an in inadequate blade. Now, I'm going to turn the fillet over and I'm going to do it really gently. I don't want to turn it with a lot of force because I can rip it or break it. You can smoke this after you take off the other side. So you'd lay your fish like this, do the exact same thing with a knife, but do it from the back. Or you can take a spoon and just scrape this meat right off. You can see how it comes right off of the spoon. You can get every ounce of meat off of the fish and you don't waste any of it. What do you do with this? You make salmon burgers out of it. It'd be fantastic. Salmon hash. You can make a French dish called a mousse or a cannelle out of it. And uh, there's many, many recipes to use that with. I'm going to switch tools right now and I'm going to use this long fillet knife. We're in a school, you can hear the bell in the background. Okay, kids, make sure you get to class on time and don't forget your homework. Okay, right now, I'm going to cut through the ribs just like so. You can see how my hand is, keeps moving on top as I move the knife a little bit. I want to be sure I don't cut myself, of course. And now I'm using the tip of the blade, like so, coming out. It's coming out at the end of the bones there. And pull it back a little bit, like so. What I'll like to do next is I'll take this blade of the knife and I'll scrape the dull side of the blade against this row of bones right here. These are called pin bones. Can you see those sticking up? By running the knife, the dull side of the blade against those, I'm able to get those to stand up out of the muscle a little bit better. And what I'm going to do with those is I'm going to remove those with a pair of pliers. I hold the pliers like this, have the curved side against the flesh like so, and I grab the, the bones with these pliers and I just pull them out one at a time. Okay, right now I'm going to uh, trim the belly flap a bit because when I go to skin the fish, I'm going to take the skin off in a second. This often will get in the way. There's a one way you can, you can cut like this. You notice how I move my hand out of the way when the knife is moving towards where it was. I don't want to cut myself, so now I can grab this bone and I could trim this piece out of here. So I, I got that out of the way. Then I like to take the belly meat and I trim this a little bit. And I use this and fillet it separately. And I use it for smoked salmon or you could use it in sushi. It's very, very fatty. As you can see, the white lines are the fat in that meat. It's delicious. I'm going to take my large knife again. And I like to use this knife for the fillet work. And what I'll do is I'm going to wipe off the scales. I'm going to start at the tail. Take my knife almost straight down and then I gradually, as I'm moving the blade back and forth, I start to cut right next to the skin. And then what I like to do is make a little incision in the tail, right here, for my finger. I'll insert a finger in that spot. So what I'll do is slide like this, get the finger in there so I have a grip on it. And then I'm going to yank the, the skin back and forth towards me and away from me as I push forward with the blade and move the blade a little bit. So it's an ambidextrous process of pushing with the right hand, like so, and then pulling with the left. Right up to the end. Okay, so here's our skin off in one nice piece and here's our fillet with the skin removed ready to be cut into portions. Next I'll cut it into fillets for you. We have our beautiful fillet of 
silver salmon, ready to be cut into portion sized pieces. You could cook this fish whole if you were to bake it, but we are going to saute it today. So what I like to do is I like to angle my knife like this when I cut for a saute, rather than straight across like so. I like the way that the portion looks when the blade is angled. You can see that this tail section is not a rectangle. It's uh, got more of an interesting shape because it's more angular. And so I'll make my first cut on an angle like this, and that'll be the tail section. Now I like to uh, keep the surface area pretty, pretty wide, so the angle of the blade helps with that. And I'm going to cut about a four and a half ounce piece of fish right there like that. You can see the, the, the muscle and where the, the uh, spine was of the fish. A lot of people when they barbecue they make a spice rub. I have one here that I made the other day for uh, a catering we did and I'm going to make one very similar to it for you today. And you can see that it's, uh, I stored it in a plastic bag and it's a blend of spices and I have most of these spices here in it. I have over here some uh, chili powder, ground up chili powder, some turmeric, garlic powder, cumin seed, ground mustard, and on my left I have uh, kosher salt, which is this, my favorite uh, cooking salt, and then I have some granulated sugar here that we'll use. And uh, I'll make a rub, rub for you with these ingredients. Okay, for you folks today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a rub, but I'm not going to write down a recipe or the exact ingredients. You can vary the ingredients as you like, and uh, I'll call it a rub or a, a seasoning blend, even though it's a saute, because what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, salt and sugar as the base for this. And I'm just going to take some salt, and you can watch what I'm doing. Figure one of these spoons, it's not really a tablespoon, it's not a measuring spoon, but I'm taking a big spoonful of salt, a little bit extra. I'm putting some sugar in there. One of the reasons I put sugar in there is because sugar works very well with, with fish. It tends to uh, firm up the flesh a bit, and it just adds a sweetness to fish that is really wonderful. So I, I usually put a little bit of uh, sugar in my rubs as well. Chili powder, one of my favorite ingredients in any kind of a seasoning blend. Uh, I'll put in this. This is not a real hot chili powder. It's, it's pretty mild. It's a, it's a lot like a paprika, really. But I'll use a little bit of this in there, or a lot, actually. That, that's probably the primary ingredient right now. You can see it, it blending. Now, here's the one that is from India. And a lot of the curries, they use turmeric in them and it gives uh, curry powder its color. I love to put a little turmeric in a lot of my food, not always so much for flavor, but for color. I think the red and the orange together really work well color-wise, and they lend a really nice color to our fish. And what we're hoping is that all these spices are going to form a crust on the outside of our fillets. A little bit of garlic for flavor, and I like to use a powder on this, as opposed to the fresh garlic. So I put a little bit of garlic in there. And today, one of my students said, hey, do you put cumin in your rubs? And I said, you know, I didn't this week, but that's a good idea. So for you, I'm putting cumin in the rub, all right? Cumin or cumin, however you want. Semilla de comino, molida. Here we go, a little bit of cumin in there. So it's not too, too strong. Uh, a flavor. Cumin is very, very powerful. And I'm going to put a little background flavor of ground mustard. Very, very little bit, but adds a little complexity to the whole blend. And I'm just going to mix that up and let's, let's compare colors to what we did today and what I did on Monday. So you can see there's a difference between the two. This is a little browner looking, a little bit darker. This one's a little bit lighter. This one here, I think I had a little more sugar in it as well, and more turmeric. So this is going to taste a little different than the one I used earlier this week, but it'll still be great in its own right. So what my point is for you is that it doesn't have to be an exact science with the rub. What you'll do is if you do this often enough, you'll come up with one that you can repeat because you like it. You use the same ingredients over and over again, and the more you prepare it, the better you'll get at it. So the question is often asked, how soon should you rub before you cook the food? A lot of chefs believe that with fish, you don't want to rub or flavor the fish too far in advance because it's so delicate. And uh, some say it doesn't 
matter. You can have it for a couple hours ahead. Well, I, I cooked a piece of fish yesterday that was rubbed for uh, over 24 hours in the refrigerator in a, in a bag, and it was phenomenal. It was salmon, so it's an oily fish, a fatty fish, and it held up very well to the flavors. So something like a filet of sole or a cod, I wouldn't rub for very long. It's almost like a dredging process. So I'll show you how I would rub it. It's the rub we made today. Here's a tray here. I would uh, be a little bit light. I'm not going to push the fish into it very hard at all. I just kind of lightly coat it. So you can see I just really delicately placed it in there, shake off the excess. That piece of fish is ready to be cooked. With some uh, mixtures with meat, you might press it in so you can get more rub on, on it, especially if you're going to let it uh, sit overnight and develop the flavor overnight. But for today, we're just going to make it really light. Let's go see what Dave is doing over at the stove. Hey, Dave, that salmon is looking great. I'm going to make the polenta, the starch part of our dish. Uh, what we've got here is polenta, ground up cornmeal, basically. It's kind of coarse in texture. Um, we want to cook it all the way so it's not grainy. I'm going to use some lobster stock with it today go to, to go along with our salmon. You could, if you were doing a chicken dish or a duck dish or some kind of game dish, you could use chicken stock um, or you could make a duck, duck stock out of it and use that too. We've also got Parmesan cheese, lots of cheese. It makes it nice and flavorful. I'm using 2% milk because the cheese is so rich and the stock's rich, so I'm going to use some 2% milk. You could use heavy cream if you really wanted to indulge. We've got some butter, uh, some chopped up garlic, some diced onion, and from the garden we've got a little thyme and a little marjoram. And we're going to start this dish off. I like to add a little bit of oil to my saute, and I'm just going to lightly saute this. I'm going to add a little bit of oil and a little bit of butter. Adding the oil and butter together, it helps so that the butter doesn't um, burn. Because when you're sauteing, if you have a really high heat and you add the butter without oil, the butter just usually burns and you end up burning everything. So you have to start over again. It's a lot easier this way. Uh, once we get this melted down, we'll just swirl it around a little bit, get it coating the whole pan. We'll start out by adding our onions. I'm going to add the onions first. I'll move them around a little bit, coat them with the butter and the oil, get them, get them going, get them heated up. And I'll let those saute for a little while. Then I'll add in my garlic and let it go for a little while. And uh, that'll bring out the oil in the garlic and the flavor in the onions, and that'll add to our dish. So that'll be great. Our onions are coming along good, so now we're going to reach over and add our garlic into there. We're just going to saute this garlic enough to bring the oil out of the garlic. So it shouldn't take long at all. You just grab this lobster stock. I'm just going to pour that right into there. We'll bring that up to a simmer, which is kind of like a little ripple above the, on the liquid that we have in the pan. And it's looking pretty good. So now I'm going to put my polenta in. Once I get it in, I'm just going to stir it around a little bit, mix it up. Now, the one thing about polenta is you have to cook it well. You don't want it gritty or grainy. You want to cook it all the way out, almost like a porridge. It's similar to a porridge, but you add it at night instead of having it in the morning. So it's good stuff. Well, it's starting to look good. Our polenta is getting cooked all the way, and it's time to add the rest of our ingredients. I think what we'll start with, so we'll start with our Parmesan cheese. And I'm just going to add this over the whole top of it and spread it out. And I'll slowly stir that in so it all gets incorporated. You don't want to put it all in one pile because if you put it all in one pile in the middle, it will uh, tend to sink right to the bottom and then start burning on the bottom of the pan. You definitely don't want that. So we stir this around to incorporate it all. I'm going to grab a little bit of uh, thyme here. Put that in. A little bit of marjoram. Well, I'll add a little bit more. And I'm going to stir that in, get it all mixed up. That ah, looks good. That looks really good. I'm going to add a little bit of milk to it, just a drop. Give it that nice creamy texture. That'll be really good for it.
And you know what? I have this leftover butter right here, and I like butter a lot. So I'm going to go ahead and dump the rest of that right in the dish. There we go. Now what I want to do is lower it, lower the heat a little bit more. And I like to cook it for, uh, I'd like to cook it till it gets a little bit firm, evaporate some more of that liquid. And what ends up happening is that liquid cooks into the polenta. And when the liquid cooks into the polenta, then all that flavor is introduced into the cornmeal. And that's the way you want it. So we'll put the lid on this, cover it up, and let it cook for about another minute, minute or two, and then we'll come back to it. Okay, right now I'm going to prepare the salmon for you. And what I wanted to talk about first was a little bit about uh, mise en place. It's a French term that we learn as chefs at the beginning of our training. As apprentices, the word that is drilled into us is mise en place. Mise en place means to have everything in its place. Everything that you think you're going to need, you might not even need to use it, but it needs to be there ahead of time. So what we have over here is uh, the cast iron pan we're going to cook the fish in. It's an old, old style very old pan. It holds heat very well, retains the heat, so we're going to use that with our fish. We've got the fish here with the spices on the outside of it. Got a pan here with a few different utensils, a fork, a spatula, a rubber spatula, a metal turning spatula, a pair of tongs in case they're needed, the cooking oil, and a little bit of butter for the fish. The, the pan has been preheated. It's on a gas flame. Gas is up fairly high. It's at least halfway up. Going to put a little bit of oil in it, just a little bit into the pan, get the oil around a bit. So let's see if we're hot enough right now. Take your product and just kiss the pan with it a little bit. You can hear the, the sound it's making. That's Okay, that's a searing noise. And what we're going to do is we're going to sear it now. Put it down. Presentation side down first. So the side that you want to serve up to your guests needs to be the side that goes into the pan first. Okay, so I put the, uh, the fish from the uh, inside of the, the fillet where I had the backbone removed. That's down. And that's going to be the presentation side. The skin side of this piece of fish is on top. So the side that I want to serve to myself or to a customer will be the side that is first down in the pan. What I'm going to look for right now is uh, smoke coming from the pan. Maybe my temperature is too hot. Remember, I have sugar in that rub, and I don't want the sugar to burn. I want it to caramelize. There's a difference between caramelization and burning. And I want to be sure I have enough oil in the pan, too. So I'm going to adjust the temperature as needed, and I'm going to add more fat as needed. And so I'm going to add a few more drops of oil. I'm going to take a look at the fish, how it's doing underneath right now. I just want to take a quick little peek underneath, and I'll use my finger to show you. We're getting some nice color on it. You see that on the camera? It's looking really good. I'm going to loosen up the fish, make sure I've got some oil under it, move it around a bit. In this pan, you could fit two pieces, no problem. So you could do a, a meal for two at one time. I wouldn't crowd the fish because when you crowd your, your food when you're sautéing, the food will, will start to sweat and you'll lose the caramelization and you won't develop the flavor that you really want. So don't overcrowd your food when you sauté. I'm ready to turn it. And here we go. Let's see what it looks like on the first side. It's got some nice color to it. And feeling with the spatula, I can feel a little bit of a crust has developed on it. So it's, it's got some good color to it, and it, it's starting to cook. I'm going to add a little bit of butter right now on top of the fish, and then I'm going to swirl that into the pan in just a little bit. That's going to add a little fresh taste to it. I'm not going to deglaze and make a sauce out of this. It's just going to be a straight uh, saute with a searing technique. There's enough flavor on the fish where it doesn't really need a sauce. The butter is going to add a nice other uh, edge to it and some sweetness and richness. And uh, it's a technique that Paul Prudhomme used to use in his uh, New Orleans blackened fish. Uh, the, I'm not really blackening. This is more close to a bronzing. And we're going to keep this fish on the medium rare side, medium rare to medium. Unlike pork, which we'd have to cook well done, with a lot of fish we can cook it a lot more on the rare side. It's, it has more moisture in it, it tastes better, and that's what we're going to do with this. Okay, we're ready to plate our meal now. We've got the polenta finished here. We've got the uh, silver salmon looking really good in the skillet. And we made some sauteed zucchini to go along with it as a vegetable accompaniment. 
a little Parmesan cheese over here for on top of the polenta and some marjoram sprigs on top of the plate. And uh, I'll put some polenta in the plate, and then Dave is going to make this into a shishi looking restaurant dish. Hey, How about that? Sounds good. Okay, just sounds like good. Seattle. Here we go. Yeah. Polenta first, right in the middle. Let's see what you can do, Dave. Build some height, maybe. Let's make it like it's a $24 entree. Hey, that sounds good. Okay, there we go. Well, let's just take the salmon. I think we'll place that over lengthwise like that right there. Oh, that looks nice. We'll take some of this zucchini, just spread it out around the outside. There we go. Let's cross some of those up. Yeah. That looks great. It's looking really good, yeah. Let's throw some parm across here. And we got a sprig of marjoram. Oh, Dave, what do you think? I think it looks, it looks really, really good. I think that uh, with a good salad and yeah. dessert, I'd pay 24 bucks for that. Good deal. Thanks for coming to Dave's Kitchen. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Take care. Bye. This program is being provided by the 15 members of the Vancouver Educational Telecommunications Consortium, TV Etc.